Welcome to Sunday Stories. I'm Michael Sanford. Over the next hour, we'll be sharing stories that celebrate the rich history, amazing people, and fascinating places throughout our region and beyond. We'll see how students encourage their peers to register as organ donors, explore how kids and parents are coping with the challenges of learning and working at home together, check in with the owners of Two Flew the Coop to see how they're managing the business in uncertain times. Discover some of Sacramento's little known past with a local historian. See how art therapy helped a young woman deal with the loss of her brother. And venture to William Land Park to learn about the lotus flower. But first, Rob Stewart introduces us to Robert Paler. Robert shares his story of grit and determination in becoming an inspirational speaker despite a devastating injury that left him paralyzed. Joining us now is Rob Paler. Ah, I'm just so happy to say that. Rob, it's yeah. great to see you. Sounds good to hear those words. I'm so excited for this, so excited. When we were speaking on the phone and, and talking about doing this, you shared a sentence with me that I'd never heard before. And my journey to overcome quadriplegia. Mm. And I thought, Wow, overcome quadriplegia. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you do yeah. it? Literally, how do you do it? You know, it's a lot. Um, I would put overcoming quadriplegia with climbing Mount Everest, uh, winning the Super Bowl. I mean, uh, maybe even over those kinds of feats. Uh, when you get that kind of diagnosis, you know that you are witnessing the terrors of the earth. Um, nobody anticipates something like this happening to them. I certainly did it in my life. And hearing that kind of, that kind of prognosis, that kind of news, it chills you to your bones. Um, that it's like being in a nightmare. I mean, a living nightmare. And there's nothing you can do to wake up. Nothing you can do to escape. It's complete reality. But after your neck was broken, uh, you were pretty much told, you may not even make it, yeah. let alone, let alone be able to move. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can just go through and tell this story. Um, yeah, do. Hey, the day was May 6, 2017. Uh, it was the day of the Collegiate Rugby National Championship. I was playing for Cal, which I got my jersey right behind me that I, was, that I put on my back that day. It was very early on in this game that I'm competing in a mall, which is when the bigger guys in rugby, we group together kind of in a single unit and we push to advance this ball. And then these opposing players, they started making these illegal moves. And then this guy wraps me around my neck in a headlock. He's pinning my chin to my chest. Someone comes in, he chops me down by the legs. So I start riding down. And since he's got me pinned in this position, you know, I'm, I'm trying to drive, I'm trying to put, put my chin up, but I've got all that weight down to where I just remember I closed my eyes, gritted my teeth for impact, and then my head just rolled, my face slammed against my chest, and then just crunch, and then poof. I could not feel or move anything below my neck. And I'm lying there, I'm screaming, and I knew what happened. I was completely conscious. I saw it and heard everything that was going on. You did. You were conscious. Everything. Everything. I remember it better than anything in my life. I did some medical imaging, uh, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs. My doctor comes in. He tells me the worst thing that he could have told me. He says, Robert, your injury is bad. Really bad. The disc in between your C5-6 vertebrae ruptured into your spinal cord. You also have some fracturing from your C4 to C7 vertebrae. Essentially what this means is you will never walk again. You will never move your hands. We're gonna do our best so you can do something like pick up a piece of pizza and bring it to your face. If you can do that, then you made it. If you can do that, you beat the odds. The phone call I made was to my religious advisor. Um, I'm a, a man of faith. My Catholic faith is very important to me and immediately I'm reaching out to God. And I call this man and I tell him what happened, this horrific prognosis. And he gives me the best advice I ever have heard. It has changed my mindset from that day forward. It's carried me. And he said, Robert, what happened to you is terrible. And throughout this journey, there's going to be a lot of things you just can't control. But the one thing, as long as you have breath in your lungs, the one thing you can control is your mindset. Mm. So your ambition, your optimism about this, your willingness to wake up every single day and fight 
is up to you. No circumstance can take that away from you. I'll tell you what, death was sitting with me in that room and death was waiting for me to quit. I could feel it lurking over me all the time, um, waiting for me to quit. And one of my respiratory therapists, as he was leaving the room after what was a three hour session of just slamming on my lungs, he just was walking out. He looked back at me and he said, Robert, you're in trouble and just left. While there was these handful of naysayers, I had thousands of people all across the world reaching out to me. We launched a GoFundMe campaign to pay for these medical expenses, which are just insane, massive. And it was all these people saying, Robert, I believe in you. You can do this. By you taking on your fight, I'm reconnecting with family members. I'm getting up and I'm setting new goals in my life. Hearing stuff like that, it made it to where breaking my neck, it wasn't even about me anymore fighting in those moments to keep living it wasn't just so i could struggle another day through this no it was a commitment to them a commitment to do something really good and this mutual benefit that we both got and that i could but i could carry this cross and i could give them everything i had and in turn they would give me the encouragement i needed to keep pushing forward um those people they carried me through that first month my chances of walking again, they weren't zero. They were probably like 1%. Yeah, 1%. Around there, kind of like that 1%, 2% range. But it wasn't zero. And I just thought, I'm going to give absolutely everything I have. I'm not going to let these days pass me by and just think, what if? But with 1%, you had a lot of room to doubt. Nice. Um, and you did not. I've seen the videos of you, Robert. I've seen the videos of how you crawled your way to standing and to walking. Yeah. And I have to tell you, I sat and went through all of the videos and it is, it is astounding to me how much strength I see in you when you may have felt at your weakest. I went from no motion at all to where I was twitching a finger and twitching a toe to where about a year later, I mean, I was like 365 days I spent in the hospital. I walked out of the hospital doors. Hearing you talk, I want to ask, is what happened to you when you broke your neck the worst thing that ever happened to you? I would say absolutely not. I have met so many amazing people. I've had all these incredible life-changing experiences. At only 23, these people I've met, these experiences I've had, they're carrying me to such a greater life. There's no way that I would be able to touch hearts and inspire souls like I can because of what happened to me. I could not do this just playing rugby, breaking my neck. You'd think breaking your neck is all bad, right? What good can possibly come out of breaking your neck? Well, being able to share that story of inspiration, being able to have someone tell me, Robert, you've changed my life. It makes the word breaking my neck is not all bad. It's a gift. It's an absolute gift in my life. And I think I had to change the circumstance for it to become a gift. I've really had to work with it. And there's so many people who have worked with me to do that, but there's no way that I could change what happened to me um, because I'm so proud of where I am today. Um, it's the greatest source of joy that I have in my life. And I think you won the biggest game of them all because life is not a game. It is, it is reality. And when you take it off the field, you, my friend, are clearly what it's all about when it comes to being a champion forever. I don't even know what to say other than that other than thank you, to be honest. You know, what I do is difficult. I do have to struggle through things every single day. There's times when I'm walking and I'm screaming with every single step and um, you know, I'm wondering, I'm trying to answer those why questions, but hearing something like that, it just, it keeps me going. The, the benefit is, is mutual. Um, it really is. A life lived for others is a life of purpose. And to, to hear something like that, to know that what I do is more than just gaining back mobility, but it, it's about touching hearts and um, it's about changing people's lives. It makes me so appreciative for everything I have. You have a light inside of you that burns so brightly. And I just am so grateful 
to have the opportunity just to be a conduit to to let that light me get out of the way and just let your light shine that's amazing rob i i can't say anything other than thank you i hope everyone gets so much out of this um it means so much to share this story and keep that purpose going in my life i love the symbolism of the jersey behind you because who knew that that would be the day that you were cut free mm -hmm. into your life and put back together that's right put back together stronger than ever before thank you rob Absolutely. Have a great day. Look at you moving <laughs> and walking. <laughs> day. Yeah. Peace yeah. Out. Peace out. Bye bye. What an extraordinary story and inspirational individual. We wish Robert the best. This next story from 2019 is about a contest that encourages high school students to teach their peers to register as organ donors through the use of visual arts campaigns. Just give somebody else life. That's the best thing you can do as a human. And I think saving life by just signing up is very, very rewarding. So I become committed to be an organ donor as well. The young people, the students, would be the best ambassadors to carry the wonderful message of organ donation. I became interested in transplantation partly because my father had a heart transplant. It was transformative for him and it opened my eyes into what transplantation could do. In the United States, it's 114,000 people waiting for a life-saving transplant. In California, it's almost 22,000 people. In our own Sacramento region, it's about 2,000 people that are waiting for a life-saving transplant. One organ donor can help save up to eight lives. One tissue donor can help transform the lives of up to 75 people. That's what we're trying to communicate to people is if your family is struck with somebody with in-stage organ failure, would you want somebody to save their lives? It's a challenge to educate the public and to the benefits of transplantation. There were a couple places in the country that had started poster contests that focused on high school students. So we expanded it not only as a poster contest, but also incorporating videos and things like that. If you educate the high school students, then they'll bring the conversation back to their homes and talk with their families. You can harness all of their creative talents and imaginations to, to, to bring forth a, a very positive message about what organ donation can do. When Dr. Perez reached out to us and said he had this idea, I was super excited. It was a great opportunity to get the kids to educate each other about donation. We've made presentations in more high schools than ever before. We've been able to uh, go into more classrooms and explain what the registry means. I first heard about the contest when the Sierra Donor Services came to our classroom, did a presentation, and they brought this competition. And I thought that that was such an easy decision for me that I thought I could incorporate that into a video or I could try to persuade other people as well. I never thought it could affect me, but it did. When I was in my freshman year, a lady came to our school and had a presentation about organ donation. So I decided to sign up as a donor and as a participant. We incorporated different languages into the contest. So now we have English, Spanish, Russian, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and there's really no limit. The ripple effect of this project is these children that speak many different languages and live in uh, households that have many generations of different ethnicities w living with them, they're able to go home and talk about their project with their family. You know, I think it's kind of in our family of trying to give back whenever you can. And so it, this was kind of an easy decision. You can just see the thought and the creativity that went into each of these. And you know that that message is reaching that family and the friends and relatives. And they're so glad they got involved because they're able to make a difference. I can just feel so rewarded because they do it because of us. And because we are educating them, we are actually making a change. It's accomplishing the purpose of reaching 
as many people as possible with the message of organ donation and transplantation. So that, that part has been a tremendous success. It's really a miracle, and an organ donor can be part of that miracle happening for these desperate people that are on the waiting list. February 14th is National Donor Day, but you can register to be an organ donor any day. Next, we turn to a story about the challenges faced by families with students learning while parents are working all at home. Producer Christina Salerno also gets some advice from California's Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris, on how kids and parents can cope with stress during the pandemic. Oh yeah, I definitely have it. Parents of children in elementary school tell us it's really challenging to balance their kids' schoolwork while often trying to work themselves. Hello! <laughs> Eric and Carly Castellano both work from home and have two children in the Natomas Unified School District, just outside of Sacramento. Isla is a first grader and Nathan is in fourth grade. What is it like being a parent who's trying to homeschool and you're both working from home right now? Very hard. Um, <laughs> The, the difference is that there's um, there's not a clear distinction any longer of like work and, and home. It's, they are totally muddled together. And I think maybe for the first time since this began, we took sat this Saturday as a day of being like, mm, yeah, no screen, no work. Um, let's just shut it down and have a day where we're not having well, we to- We are not working. We're not fractured, right? I would say the best way that I've been able to, what word I've been able to use is um, fractured constantly. The Castellanos praise the Natoma School District for getting students online quickly. Both kids have schoolwork that keep them busy from about 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there haven't been adjustments for them either. How is your online school going? How do you feel like everything is going for you right now? It's, for me, it's going okay. Um, I wouldn't say it's the best time I had it doing school. Actually, it's definitely not. <laughs> um, it's pretty um, simple. What about you, Isla? How's is, how's everything going with you? Good, but it's good, but I don't like it, and everything's really easy. What don't you like about it? What's what's been a little bit hard? Like getting onto Zoom and doing everything with the computer. The kids went from having very limited screen time to using it as their primary method for school and to talk to their friends. The family focuses on the positive, like the trampoline that's come inside the house and the closer bond between siblings. But there's no denying that this is not normal life. As a therapist, you know, I see you, my their anxiety is much higher right now than I've ever experienced. Um, you know, having a hard time going to sleep or waking up in the middle of the night, having nightmares where our kids are, I would say both extremely well adjusted, you know, like mm -hmm. they're happy kids. And so that stuff is, even though like we try to be really careful of what we talk about and answer at their developmental level and everything, but they still are hearing things. We heard from many teachers and parents who say that their number one focus right now is the social and emotional health of students. We asked California Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, about what we should all be keeping in mind during these times of high stress and anxiety. The thing that I tell parents is that now is a really good time for us to give ourselves a break. And in fact, giving ourselves a break isn't just good for us, it's good for our kids as well because the most important ingredient for a healthy child is a healthy parent. How is stress impacting learning right now? And I mean, how much, I guess, should we realistically be expecting our kids to be learning when they're kind of in this state of stress? So uh, some of the things that we're seeing is that the impact of stress hormones have a, an outsized effect on our ability to learn, our ability to focus, pay attention, uh, task shift, right? Even I think as adults, we're noticing that it's a little bit hard, harder to shift from one task to the next and be as productive and focused as we would like to be. 
And um, that's real. That's the effect of stress hormones on the brain. And um, we want to recognize that for kids, it's going to be, um, uh, they're going to be feeling that and it's going to be uh, perhaps more challenging for them to have the same level of focus and uh, educational success. So a couple of the pieces that we want to do are number one, supporting, uh, so recognizing this and supporting our kids as they're trying to do distance learning, right? Uh, um, supporting them with lots of encouragement and reinforcement, but then also making sure that we're building in times during the day for kids to play, right? Because kids process stress through play. And there's an opportunity for us to um, be playful with what's going on right now, right? And figure out uh, some of our uh, strategies, get a little silly with it um, around how we as a family can cope with the, the new normal, which is, you know, being at home and, and dealing with this pandemic. Dr. Burke Harris recommends that people read the Surgeon General's stress-busting playbook at covid19.ca.gov. There you'll find tips like making sure to exercise at least 60 minutes a day, practicing mindfulness or meditation or prayer, and tips for healthy eating and sleeping. More of the interview with Dr. Nadine Burke Harris can be seen in the Sunday Stories Extras section at kvie.org slash Sunday Stories. Our next story is also about coping, the use of art therapy at UC Davis Children's Hospital to help young people cope with and heal from the loss of a loved one. Tommy was my younger brother and I was older, but he was much bigger. He was 6'4". We were always very close as siblings. All the time, I just want to shout, you know, I had a brother, his name was Tommy. He was great for all these reasons, but I can't really do that. And so this group was a really good place to um, kind of decompress those feelings and create art that represented it. Art therapy is about the process of making artwork to be an e a mirror image, to be a projection. It's all about exploring the materials, and having the paint or the clay or whatever the medium it is adapted to fit your needs in that moment. It's just a really good way for me to, without consciously thinking about it, just translate these things that I've been feeling that have made me feel empty or miserable or just negative have turned into something that I can look at and then create something that matures into just a different type of feeling, into one that's not as raw. There's not a lot of words to describe those traumatic, painful memories and emotions. So we use a nonverbal subconscious medium to externalize those emotions and get them out into the open. I filled in one of the eye sockets with black and just seeing the visuals of the black paint slipping down the cheek, it just was very powerful for me because oftentimes I felt too numb to even cry, you know, even when I was alone. And so seeing this mask that I'd made to represent myself be allowed to express that was very powerful. Through artwork, you can see your progress through grief. And so that's a physical reminder of, I am going through change and it is getting better. The guys and their feathered friends in our next story might seem familiar. We profiled Greg, Brian, and their chickens in 2019. Producer Tyler Bastine checks in with the owners of Two Flew the Coop to see how their backyard chicken business has been doing during the pandemic. We have Brian Fikes and Greg Howes joining us right now. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. 
so you guys own Two Flew the Coop in Sacramento. Um, for those who aren't familiar with your business, just briefly describe what, what is Two Flew the Coop? So Two Flew the Coop, our kind of uh, tagline is everything for backyard chickens. We retail artisan coops. Uh, we also sell Modesto Milling uh, premium organic feed. And then we offer uh, education through Soil Born Farms and the Natural Foods Co-op. And then we do private consultations and things for people as well. And, and you know, something worth mentioning, you guys are a very small business. Yeah, I always say, you know, it's not really even a mom and pop business or a pop, it's more of a mom and pop. <laughs> That's how small it is. <laughs> it is a small time operation. Last time we profiled your business, it was 2019. Now we're 2020. Uh, there were a couple new developments personally. Brian, you were working at the state. Yes, March 9th this year was my last day at work. And the 10th was my first day of retirement. And I think on the 17th, the governor did his order to stay at home. Got out just before all the madness. He had good timing, happening. as they Perfect say. <laughs> now, Brian, since you retired, have you been a little more involved with the business? It's still been about the same amount of work. Instead of being at the state Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, those hours are now freed up. And he's around here an awful <laughs> lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're able to go outside. Distance can be forgiving. <laughs> so how, how were things going into 2020? You know, it was kind of business as usual for us. Um, everything looked to be, you know, normal at that point before, you know, everything kind of hit and, and the rug was pulled out from all of us. It was looking to be, you know, we always look forward to spring. It's kind of the time of year when baby chicks come for sale at the feed stores. And really the season for chickens, although we keep them all year, it's really the season gets started in the in kind of early spring. You were about to do like a little Northern California tour on educating people. We had um, kind of contracted with the, the mill that we sell feed for, Modesto Milling out of Modesto, um, to do a series of kind of like Chick 101s at feed stores throughout Northern California. And we were able to do one. And then, you know, again, everything just hit and everyone had to cancel. So hopefully we can offer that next year. Yeah, yeah. And so I imagine there was probably an increase in business, all of a sudden everybody's, you know, stuck at home, and I'm sure there was an influx in 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 raising backyard chickens during this. Yeah, there was quarantine. there was a little bit, little little bit of an increase. Um, you know, it became that people were buying chickens like they were toilet paper, pasta, and hand sanitizer. You know, we, we kind of it's sort of a, a joke, but it was it's the truth. Um, I did speak with um, Connie out of Bradshaw Feed, who's the manager out there. They're the, probably the largest source for baby chicks in the Sacramento area. And she said it was like they were giving away gold for a few months there because people were coming in and they ha would have lines out the door to get baby chicks. Are you um, this is unprecedented. You know, it's normally um, active in the springtime for people to get chicks. And it was crazy this year. So wait, was there a chicken shortage? There was, there was? absolutely. I mean, again, people were waiting sometimes in line an hour or two before the feed stores opened. That's how crazy it was. Well, it was, it was like getting Rolling Stone tickets. <laughs> was, <laughs> but when there was the um, scare with the food insecurity, people not finding eggs at the supermarket or whatever. So they were like, oh, we're going to buy baby chicks. It'll be something the whole family can do. That really is what, what spurred you know, the, the, the big impetus to buy baby chicks was the food insecurity. Remember everybody started baking? Right. Shut yeah. down. And then there were no eggs at the store, no yeast. So people probably thought, I'll have my own eggs. I'll get some chickens. Of course, it takes, of course about, it takes six months, about six months you know? for the eggs to be there. <laughs> From baby chick to, uh, to maturity, about six months. But yeah. But that had to be kind of concerning for you guys, though, right? Because, you know, it's an impulse buy almost. You remember, Tyler, from our class, we always say it should never be an impulse buy. And I think in many cases, it probably was. We also spoke with a vet recently, too. And she was, um, she was really alarmed because she was getting a lot of calls from people that had no idea what they were doing. They were, they were on the front line. And then things kind of trickle and filter to us for feed and then also for coops too. So we did see an increase. Has the business been affected any other way? Um, we were concerned when Initially, we first started. We were concerned about were, traveling. Would we be able to county. continue, you know, doing what we're doing? But the fact is that we're considered, you know, essential because it's to, to feed, you know, people's livestock. So we were able to continue, you know, what we were, were doing because we were concerned about going to pick up our feed orders in Modesto and crossing county lines and whatnot. But we were, you know, we were okay. 
so I mean, for you guys, not much has changed really in how you're operating and right? It, other other it than- It did affect the coop sales too, because we've had a good relationship with two of the local nurseries. And with the shutdown at the nurseries, it was hard to have a coop present over there. Yeah, so presence. that's true. We really have sold most, mostly from, from, from our property here. You know, we've always, um, we, we called it being very Mayberry-esque and old fashioned. Good morning, Russ. I've got feed for you. Folks can kind of come by, you know, at their, at their will, as long as they let us know when, when they want to come by and pick up feed. And we can leave it out for them and they just drop payment in our, in our, in our mailbox. So this way we can be totally, you know, contact free if folks want to be. Certainly there are some folks that you know, need help and they need it loaded in their trunk, we're fine to do that, but we wear a mask and whatnot. So actually converting to sort of COVID protocols, we were kind of doing and offering some of that anyways. So it wasn't a big sort of change of operations for us. And um, sorry, I think the phone's going off. We'll see if we can get rid of that. Speaking of, I love your voicemail. Well, that's because you haven't heard it like 3,000 times. <laughs> I think many of our friends are pretty tired of it. Well, how are the chickens doing? How are the ladies? Have they been? The ladies are, are, are doing well. They inquired about you. Like I said, they were, they were curious as to how they could possibly untie your tennis shoes virtually. <laughs> um, but they're doing well. Have the chickens been helping you stress-wise, emotionally, I guess? That's really yeah. a great question. And it's something, yes, for us personally, but I am hearing that from, you know, when people will come and pick up feed, they're like, thank goodness, you know, I have, I have my chickens. They have been a wonderful diversion during this. So yes, they really have helped in their own, in their own way. Somebody has a lot to say this morning. She does. So what's next for you guys? We're planning on sh shutting down next week and going to the south of France. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish that were true. We've been doing day to day like everyone else. And hopefully if they get a vaccine next year, we'll be able to do the seminar circuit again. Uh, for Because we really enjoy the educational outreach part of our business. Yeah, it really is. What's nice about the classes and seminars and lectures and things is that these are people that are brand new or just starting on their on their backyard poultry adventure. And it's so exciting and new for them. And of course, we love poultry and always will, but it, it rekindles that spark in us, I'd say. It's, it's really fulfilling that way. Now, I do talk too, but as you <laughs> noticed, he can just talk a bit. nonstop without taking a breath. Before we wrap it up real quick, is there anything that you would like to mention that maybe I didn't touch on? Because we are not offering any you know, scheduled and um, formal classes or lectures right now, people are more than welcome to call us. Um, you know, it, it, if they need some advice and information, those that are new, we're glad to help in any way that we can. It's always fun catching up with Greg and Brian. We wish them continued success. In our next story, host Scott Syfax delves into Sacramento's unknown history with local historian and author William Berg, who shares some little known facts about Sacramento's past. William, what is the importance of us knowing our history? One of the main draws of history is the inspiration that you can get from it. But not everybody is always inspired by history. Uh, we learn history to, for the stereotyping is to avoid making the mistakes of the past and to inform future decisions. But very often, uh, a lot of people look at the, the icons that we hold up as examples of great civic leaders of the past, and they don't see someone who looks like them or thinks like them. And for others, they may see someone who looks like them and thinks like them, but they don't see icons held up in people of the past that don't look like them or don't think like them. And in both cases, it disconnects us from our past. And so it becomes harder to learn, harder to uh, make that connections to the history of our communities, the history of people who don't look like us, and the, the values of our society uh, almost get lost because the lessons that were learned through hard experience, through blood, through labor, they don't get passed along without 
that sense of history, whether it's a, a physical place like a historic building or the story of a person from our past. Uh, when a building's demolished, it's, it's gone. It's easy to forget. If a person is no longer there and their story isn't told, then their story can vanish. So that's the risk we have with not learning our history. And uh, that's the kind of history that I try to focus on is the untold stories. When, when you're sharing uh, Sacramento's history with others, what inspires you? from their reactions when they learn about things that might be kind of surprising to them. That's, that's really the part of it is the, the challenge of the unknown. If you're a gold miner, you want to mine gold where no one else has mined it because you're more likely to find it there. It may not be there, but at least no one else has looked and, and gone there before you. So it's the opportunity to map out new roads. And then very often making connections with people who don't think of history as, as something interesting or something engaging. People talk about history the way they talk about broccoli. They know it's good for you, but they haven't had any lately. But how do you make broccoli interesting? Little cheese sauce, a little, little bacon makes it tasty. So making history tasty, making something that, that tastes good, that people enjoy, and they want to share it, that's really fun. What story of dealing with the history of Sacramento tends to be the most tasty to the audiences that you speak to? Well, the, the new flavor that... I've kind of become obsessed with over the past decade or so are the stories of the West End. And that's the neighborhood that Sacramento doesn't have anymore, roughly from about 9th Street on Capitol Avenue to the river. That part of the city where there's nothing older than about 1950, where we used to have a neighborhood of extraordinary diversity and vitality. It was the heart of Sacramento's African-American neighborhood. It's Japantown. Uh, the Latino community was centered there the southern end of our Chinatown and other communities of color, all in one place, along with a, a built environment that a lot of it dated back to the gold rush. And in, in that West End neighborhood, uh, what, what aspect of it do, would people be most surprised to learn about uh, that it was known for during the time that it was thriving? Well, it was known for, for a lot of things, for the political activism and community spirit of those communities of color, of the businesses that they engendered, including like, things like restaurants, live entertainment, music, art, and other community institutions that they built, uh, often with, with a lot of community resistance from the rest of the city. And all of that was uh, uh, wiped away because of what? Because of redevelopments in the 1950s, federal funds became available to remove large portions of American cities. Sacramento became, in a lot of cases, a test market for some new mechanisms to finance redevelopment. It's called, one was called tax increment financing. It's, it became known as the Sacramento model. And because Sacramento was a, a city of relatively moderate size, unlike really large cities, we were able to demolish that neighborhood so completely that in a lot of ways it was erased from our cultural memory. Wow, so, so tell us about some of the um, leading institutions that were within this neighborhood and what they provided that really speaks to how lively and vibrant it was. Well, in the case of Sacramento's African-American community, which dates back to the gold rust, there were churches like St. Andrew's AME. And, that one is still around. Right? Yeah, that are, yes, that are still around. Or uh, Salome Baptist Church, which is still around, Shiloh Baptist Church. And they fought for the right of Afri African-Americans to, to be able to testify in court, which wasn't allowed in the 1850s. This was before the end of slavery in the United States. And there was the, the white people of California essentially were divided into two camps. One that felt that California should be a slave state and one that felt it should be whites only. That put the communities of color of California in a pretty uncomfortable position, but they decided rather than to give in, but to fight. And so that political legacy was really the foundation of Sacramento. And then 50 years later, the term the West End came from a group called the West End Club, which was known by a few different names, uh, was the the Eureka Club and a, a few other 
names for an organization was intended as an African-American parallel to the Sutter Club as a, a, a community organization really? for, for, for political organizing, for social advancement, and also for recreation but, and for business. And that's what, so far as I know, is the institution that gave the neighborhood its name. Prior to that, it was called the Tenderloin. Um, or the Japanese American community, which also grew up uh, uh, more in the, the late 19th century as immigrants started coming in from Japan. Sacramento, about 1910, 1920, was, it wasn't the largest Japan town in the United States, but in terms of percentages of population, we were one of the most Japanese cities in the United States. And so they brought their civic institutions, churches and social organizations, and their cultural institutions, sushi and sake. And these were all present in Sacramento during this era, mixed with what was available in the United States to create something new, a Japanese-American community. What now what part of Sacramento's founding in its early days has by and large been forgotten uh, by all of us that have lived here uh, and enjoy the city as it is today? Sometimes it wasn't necessarily forgotten by those of us who have lived here, but we never learned it in the first place. And so that the history of, of our Chinatown, another legacy of the gold rush, and their very often their alliances with the African American community for that right of testimony and and to overcome other social barriers, uh, they became, uh, they were different neighborhoods, physically parallel to each other, located in the same neighborhood, but often living separate lives. But they all were part of this greater whole of the West End, which if from today's perspective, we'd look at this neighborhood and we'd see a walkable, dense, mixed use neighborhood with good transit access and accessibility to thousands and thousands of jobs and a wonderfully culturally diverse neighborhood with many entertainment options. But in the early 20th century, they called it blight. What's interesting is that if this was such a vibrant neighborhood and arts and culture and entertainment were all available there, uh, all of that was destroyed by redevelopment and we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars, essentially in things like the Golden One Center, the improvements to our museums and things like that to bring all that back. And so uh, it, it's almost like a cycle that uh, has repeated itself. It, it, history, there's a saying that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So, but there are common themes. There were efforts to try to clean up the West End as early as the early 1900s because it was, it was already a fairly notorious neighborhood. And uh, a lot of it had its origins, quite frankly, in racism. And in Sacramento, trying to reclaim its civic identity, we had been the second largest city on the West Coast. And we saw other cities supersede Sacramento for that position. We fell farther and farther behind. Wait a minute. I, I, I have to jump in. Sacramento was the second largest city on the West Coast? From, from really our, the beginnings of our days as a state, up until the mid-1870s, around 1880. That's when Los Angeles, because they had a land boom and two transcontinental railroads in a rate war with each other, they superseded us. And then that same railroad came to Oakland, and Oakland got bigger than us. And then Portland and Seattle grew bigger than us. And we, we felt ourselves shrinking. And Sacramento civic leaders said, well, well, what's the problem here? And how do we solve it? Well, you know, that's interesting because the big four all used to live here. Uh, Huntington, Crocker, Stanford, um, and I, I'm forgetting the last one. Mark Hopkins. Mark Hopkins. They all uh, at one point had resided in Sacramento and then they migrated away to other places. What happened to Sacramento being such a, a, a major, at least for that era, metropolis? And uh, did we kind of lose our mojo? Uh, not so much the mojo. Was the, the number one was the gravity of San Francisco. That's where the big four moved. That was traditionally the pattern. You, you moved to Sacramento, made your money, and then moved to San Francisco, and you built your great civic edifices there. And maybe your house in Sacramento became an orphanage or something. And so, uh, except for... Uh, E.B. Crocker, who founded the Crocker Museum. Uh, so we didn't necessarily lose our mojo as we just got bounced out of line. Uh, part of it was weather, uh, flooding, access to a port or to having multiple railroads. It just kind of worked out that way. 
but the solution Sacramento's leaders came up with was instead they would uh, deny that we were a city. And the, the mythology of Sacramento as a quiet bucolic farm town, which we never were, began to supplant the image of Sacramento as bustling city. And that's when in some cases the, the, the deification of John Sutter as the original farmer who benevolently came to Sacramento and taught the Nissan on how to farm. But I, I hope you don't, yeah, I'm being very sarcastic here. <laughs> but, it, it, it's yeah. okay, but I, 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 you said something that really jumped out at me, which is that Sacramento was never a farm town. We label ourselves today as the farm to fork capital of the world. Uh, I, I'm trying to figure out the basis on, on how you make that statement and how you connect that up to all of our trumpeting about our farm to fork history? We've got plenty of forks, but not a lot of farms. Every city is surrounded by far or farms, and every city was surrounded by farms and other resources areas. In fact, it's a, major, it's a major theme in urban history is connecting resource flows from great cities like Chicago to the primate city. And this is where that food gets turned into something that you can ship and we also built the systems that you shipped those goods on. We built the first transcontinental railroad principally to ship the product of the valley, but it wouldn't have been shippable if you couldn't bring it to Sacramento, which had that large diverse population. We built railroads, we built railroad locomotives, and we canned and bottled and brewed and stored and froze all of the, the goods of the valley to turn them into something else. That transformation is a power that cities have that we still have. But uh, in a lot of cases, because we have this civic mental image of the bucolic farm town still, we focus on the farm to fork instead of the, the forks themselves, instead of the people who are working the farms, instead of the people who are transforming. So you the, consider, so you consider the, the whole farm to fork kind of uh, mantra a bit of a mythology? It's definitely mythology. And mythology, myths can be useful. Myths can be helpful. And what I'm trying to do is essentially introduce other myths. And, the, and myths, whether they're true or not, are less important than what's the lesson that they deliver. Do they educate? And is that education real? And the, the, the farm myth has its hazards and it has its, um, its aspects uh, regarding race that uh, have been really poisonous in some ways uh, to our city. And, and again, because we're in a, a 21st century city where things like having a diverse population, having a lively and active downtown are desirable, they were very much not half a century ago. They were very much not during the redevelopment era. The, the word city was a four letter word. Who knew city was considered a four letter word? More of the interview with William Berg can be seen in the Sunday Stories excerpts from section at kvie.org slash Sunday Stories. And finally today, Rob Stewart takes us to the Peace Pond in Sacramento's William Land Park to meet master gardener Daisy Ma. Daisy introduces us to the lotus flower blossoms and shares the story of how it's become one of the largest collections in North America. It is so good to see you again, Daisy. Hey, same here. Look at this. Mm. <laughs> I mean, this is spectacular. Yeah, it's something you won't see anywhere else but Asia. Tell me exactly what we are looking at. These are lotus flowers. Yes. But what all are we seeing? Well, this is a lotus plant that used to live in a planter about maybe 15 years ago that was protected by a cage so that um, the ducks wouldn't consume it because every part of this plant is edible. The leaves, the, the seed seeds, pod. The roots, and uh, it's an ancient plant from uh, Asia. They're stunning. They're exquisite. You may have noticed that Daisy said, a lotus plant. You are looking at the person who planted this. You're responsible for this. 
I mean, I just, I thank you. <laughs> it's spectacular. Uh, it's become a, a place where um, people are drawn to, you know, families come and uh, elder or older people who normally don't come to the park come to see the lotus. We've seen many out here today. Yeah, yeah. This started with one plant. Slowly but surely it, it, you know, it started in one section and then it just kept going and going, but that's the nature of water plants. They, they're unstoppable as long as they have water. You know, I have to say that that says a lot about the power of one and what one thing mm -hmm. can do. Mm -hmm. One plant. Yes. One thought, one action, um, one step in the right or wrong direction can explode like this. Yes. And you mentioned that many people are calling this Peace Pond. Yes. Mm -hmm. It would be so nice for peace to spread that way. What do you think about the name Peace Pond? Oh, I think that's a beautiful name. It, it, for years, it was called the Duck Pond, which, you know, it's sort of more um, generic. And But peace is something we, I think, we are all striving for, or we would hope for right now during these unsettling times. Tell me about the actual the flower. How long does it last? The actual flower doesn't last that terribly long, but it starts, the plant starts blooming in May. It likes the warm temperatures of Sacramento and it will bloom into October, which is amazing that it has that long, beautiful bloom period. Part of my reason for being a gardener was to make the world more beautiful. I was seeing how uh, the immigrants from Southeast Asia were uh, struggling with uh, adapting to their new world. And I thought, you know, I want to plant something that will speak to them. And, and I think I was successful. This is the best year yes. that the Lotus have had mm -hmm. since planting planted around 2005, we're in 2020 and look. I have to tell you something, the person you're taking a picture of planted all of these. Oh my gosh, bravo to you. I know. Okay. <laughs> I just have to, I have to say that every time someone stops to take a picture, I'm like, it's, she did this. I just planted one though. And they all did this. <laughs> See, it's it's every people just love. Yeah, everyone can that. connect to it. I'm coming from Rysalia and just come here to see the lotus flowers. It reminds me of China, because yeah. in China, we have this flower in the southern China. Yeah. yeah. And so what's that, like a 30 minute drive maybe? No, it's three hours. It's a long time. Three hours and 17 minutes. Wow. Just to see these flowers. Yes. In Asia, this has so much symbolism. It, uh, it's a symbol of reincarnation and purity and what the, what I keep hearing or reading is that it emerges from the muck and the mud, pure and beautiful. And that's kind of what people should strive for, even though they might have some negative, you know, flaws, um, they can always become better. We all get down in the mud. <laughs> we, we can. But we can also do this. Yes, emerge beautiful. What does the lotus mean to you personally? It was kind of a present for me to the community to, to grow it. And there aren't many, like I said, there aren't many places where you would see lotus. And so it was like, I need to create more beauty. So that, I think that helps our society. I would like to ask you if you could speak for the lotus flower, what would you say? To me, it connects us kind of to the way past in that we could have something that is so ancient and primordial living here and thriving. So that gives me a little bit of hope that, you know, our world hasn't been so inhospitable that we can, 
we can't grow something so ancient. And beautiful. And beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's, it's astounding to me that with all of the bad and good things that have happened in this world, the beauty is what will outlast us. And the lotus is a great example of that. Yeah. Well, I've heard that people come from out of state to, um, to be near the lotus. Thank you, Daisy. It's my pleasure. I'm forever grateful for you. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful to be able to speak to you today. Looking forward to seeing the lotus flowers blossom again this spring. And that's it for today. I'm Michael Sanford. It's been a pleasure being a part of your Sunday. We hope you've enjoyed today's stories and that you'll be back for another episode of Sunday Stories. Until then, have a great week. Download the free PBS video app to stream all your favorite KVIA programs whenever, wherever, on your phone, computer, or TV.